everyone, and welcome to your personal phlebotomy guru, the only talk show on the planet devoted exclusively to your favorite topic and mine, drawing blood samples. I'm Dennis Ernst, your host. One of the most common requests we receive is for articles on various tubes and how they should be used and handled. Well, how boring is that? Instead of writing another technical article, we decided to go out and find a few blood collection tubes themselves and let them tell us in their own words. Boy, did I get an earful. First hand from a red top, a blue top, a green top, and a lavender. The series kicks off with an interview with a blue top tube. We found him to be a delightful chap, but one of the more needier tubes that we sat down with. Nevertheless, he's an interesting fellow, and we're happy to have him with us on the line. Mr. Blue Top, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Thanks for having me. And thank you for making time for us today. You know, our viewers are very interested in hearing what you have to say. Most of them have never heard a tube talk before, so you're likely making history here. First, tell us your name and what do you do? I'm a sodium citrate tube. I don't know my name because my label is on my backside. I spend most of my life empty, except for my anticoagulant, but when I'm filled with blood, I get sent to a lab and tested. After that, my life is over. Short and sweet, but I live to be tested. Uh, tested for what? Protimes, activated partial thromboplastin times, APTVTs, Special factor assays, almost exclusively coagulation studies. I have a very precise amount of sodium citrate in me so that when I'm filled, I'll render the most accurate result possible. If I don't have a 9 to 1 ratio of blood to additive in me, neither the most sophisticated instrument nor the most competent laboratory professional will be able to extract an accurate test result from me. It's that simple. I must be at least 90% filled. Then what if you're not? If you send me underfilled to the lab and I don't get rejected, and I don't always do even though I should, look out. The patient's result is likely to be falsely elevated, making his or her physician alter the blood thinner dosage so that their clotting ability is out of whack. That can lead to hemorrhage and uncontrollable bleeding. All because I wasn't at least 90% filled. It's not my fault. It's the fault of the person who was supposed to fill me, and the person who didn't reject me. I happen to have a line on my label so the collector will know when it's full. But some of my cousins don't. Ignorance might be bliss, but not if you don't know if the tube is underfilled which can lead to a medication error. You said you're a sodium citrate tube. What does sodium citrate do? Sodium citrate prevents the blood from clotting once I'm filled by taking calcium out of service. Since calcium is necessary for clotting to occur, the fact that I chelate or neutralize it means the blood doesn't coagulate. That's why they call me an anticoagulant tube. But in order to do my job, I have to be well mixed immediately after collection to make sure I get all the calcium taken care of. Three to five complete inversions should do it. Once I'm filled and mixed, I'm labeled and taken to the laboratory at room temperature. It used to be that blue tops like me were immediately chilled during transportation to the lab. Then the industry finally figured out that when I'm chilled, Factor 7 is activated, which can lead to falsely lower coagulation times. We've been kept at room temperature ever since. Well, at least until we're tested, that is. Every now and then I hear horror stories about my kind still being iced by those who don't know we shouldn't be. It sends chills up and down my little plastic spine. Okay, well, let's take some callers. We've got Kay on the line with us from Adelaide, South Australia. Hello, Kay. Welcome to your personal phlebotomy guru. Hello, Dennis. Thank you for taking my call. I really love your show. Blue Top, I have a question about discard tubes before you're filled. Here in Australia, we stopped acquiring a discard tube before filling Blue Tops like you for most drawers back when the standards changed in 2003. 
I wonder how that change impacted you and other blue tops. Did you miss not having a discard tube drawn before you? I'm glad you brought that up, Kay. With one or two exceptions, a discard tube was never necessary in the first place. It used to be a foregone conclusion that when the needle punctures the flesh, a minute bit of tissue thromboplastin, which is a clotting factor, got into the needle and then into the first tube filled. Truth be told, tissue thromboplastin has never been shown to alter coag results of the first tube drawn. It was pure speculation until studies came out and disproved it, at least for protimes and APTTs. It took until the late 1990s for the world to wake up and smell the thromboplastin, or lack thereof. That's when the myth that it affects coag results was put to rest. In 2003, CLSI, after reviewing overwhelming evidence in the literature that tissue thromboplastin, if it even gets into the needle at all, doesn't affect protimes or APTTs of the first tube drawn, well, they stopped recommending a discard tube. Unfortunately, not everyone has gotten the word yet, and some places still draw a discard. There's no harm in drawing a discard tube, it's just not always necessary. But back to your original question, do I miss not having a discard tube drawn before me? Well, let me put it this way. I like being the first tube in the order of draw. But you're not first. I most certainly am. Unless you're drawing a blood culture, of course, but I'm first after that. Always? Well, almost always. Seems like you're a tube of many exceptions. Well, only two, besides the blood culture exception. I rest my case. The first is if you're using a butterfly set coupled into a tube holder. And then only if no blood cultures are filled before me. If not, and there is no discard tube, the air in the tubing will exhaust some of my vacuum. As a result, I'll run out of pulling power before I'm filled. And you could end up with a short draw. So putting on a discard tube to prime the tubing is a must under those circumstances. The other exception is optional. While studies have shown that protimes and APTTs aren't affected when I'm the first tube drawn, nobody has studied the potential for tissue thromboplastin to affect other factor assays, like factor VIII, factor IX, or other esoteric coagulation tests. So CLSI plays it safe in their standards by leaving it up to the facility as to whether or not a discard tube should be drawn in those circumstances. Let's take another caller. We have Terry in Danville, Pennsylvania. Terry, welcome to the show. Thank you, Dennis. I'm a first time caller, long time listener though. Hi, Blue Top. I'm a big fan of yours. Have been for years. My question is a follow up about what you said about discards. I know I don't need a discard before filling you for most draws anymore, but is there anything really wrong with using a discard tube? Not at all, Terry. It's just that many studies have shown that it's not necessary when drawing protimes or APTTs. But if a discard tube is used, it should be either a coag tube or a plain non-additive tube. Never use a tube with a different anticoagulant or a clot activator. Great question, Terry. Let me ask you this, Blue Top. We've got a lot of students watching, and the difference between serum and plasma is always a hard concept to grasp. What about you? After you're spun, what is the liquid part on top of your cells, plasma or serum? Plasma. Serum is what you get after centrifugation when the specimen clots. See, when blood is allowed to clot, all the clotting factors are consumed as the end product is created. That end product is fibrin. That's what binds up all the cells and turns the blood into a gelatinous mass. Red Top can tell you more about this. I'm assuming you're going to interview him at some point in this series, aren't you? Oh yes, next week in fact. Well, good luck with that. He's a real piece of work. Anyway, when clotting is complete and the tube is centrifuged, what rises to the top is serum. It has no clotting factors left. After tubes like me are spun, all the clotting factors are left. 
except the one that the anticoagulant neutralized so clotting could not take place. That's plasma. So serum comes from tubes that have clotted. Plasma comes from tubes that haven't. We have another caller. George from Boston joins us on the line. Welcome to the program, George. Thank you for taking my call. First time call, a long time listener. Nice to speak with you, Mr. Blue Top. You're one of the most important tubes my staff collects, but you're also one of the most persnickety. Uh, no offense, but you seem to be pretty, well, needy. What are the most important handling and processing requirements that you would like my staff, and phlebotomists everywhere for that matter, to understand and meet without fail? I don't consider myself needy, George, but complex. Way more than that simpleton red top. Here's what you need to know. If you're filling me for an APTT, get me to the lab in time to test me within four hours. After that, the results may not be accurate. That's not my rule. That comes right from CLSI, the standards folks. And if the patient is on unfractionated heparin, I should be centrifuged within one hour. The plasma removed and tested within four hours. If it will take longer than four hours for testing an APTT on any patient, well, the plasma should be removed and frozen at minus 20 degrees Celsius for up to two weeks and rapidly thawed at 37 just before testing. But according to CLSI, there's no guarantee the APTT won't be affected by freezing. Any exceptions to those handling requirements? Only one. Some facilities have done internal studies that prove longer stabilities. When supported by documented evidence, longer delays before testing may be acceptable. Users should always follow facility policy. Well, I must admit, you're a very exceptional tube. Why, thank you. It's just that phlebotomy isn't as simple as some people want it to be. We're talking about the human body here. Blood does funny things when it's removed from a vein. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. Thank you for your time, Blue Top. You're welcome. Can I go back to work now? I'm anxious to chelate some more calcium. <laughs> you certainly may. You go right ahead and chelate all you want. Thanks to you and all of our callers. Join us next time when we interview Mr. Red Top. Ah, I'm promising you it's going to be a show you won't want to miss. Until then, I'm Dennis Ernst, your personal phlebotomy guru, reminding you to keep sticking to the standards.